Changing electric fields don't cause magnetic fields, and just as importantly, changing magnetic fields don't cause electric fields. Hi everyone, welcome to Atoms and Sporks, and today I want to talk about some misconceptions I hear about electromagnetic radiation and light. And actually, I want to tell you about how the entirety of the physics of electromagnetism is more straightforward than a lot of people seem to think. Let me start by sort of laying out a way of thinking about electromagnetism and light that I'm going to say isn't that great. Now, not everything I'm about to say is wrong, uh, although some of it is, but it's making things a lot more clunky and complicated than they need to be. So let's lay out these ideas I want to attack. The idea is that electromagnetism is basically all about three fundamental objects. You have your electric charges, which create electric fields. You have your electric currents, which create magnetic fields. And finally, there's a third very special object called an electromagnetic wave, or electromagnetic radiation, which is kind of its own independent thing. These waves are often illustrated with a diagram like this. What this is basically showing is that if I stood at a certain spot as one of these waves passed me by, that I would detect an electric field whose direction was oscillating up to down, up to down, up to down, up to down, and I would detect a magnetic field whose direction is oscillating left to right, left to right, left to right. And if I singled out one of these maxima to stalk, because, hey, everyone needs a hobby, I'd find that this maxima, this peak, travels at the speed of light. And then that's one of the big reveals of electromagnetism. It's not a coincidence that this electromagnetic radiation travels at the speed of light. It is light. That's what light is. It's one of these sinusoidal electromagnetic waves. But in fact, it's often said that these electromagnetic waves aren't just independent, but the reason they exist is because they're also self-creating. As the story goes, electric and magnetic fields interact with each other. Specifically, if I have, at a spot, a changing electric field, that changing field then creates a magnetic field. Changing electric fields create magnetic fields. On the flip side, if I have a changing magnetic field, that then creates an electric field. So it's said that these perfect little sinusoidal objects propagate out forever across the cosmos because they're basically the perfect exploit to these interactions. They're a cheat code, if you will, to this way that electric and magnetic fields interact with each other and create and reinforce themselves. And end misconception. So what I want to do today is maybe sort of tear down a lot of these ideas, but maybe just to quickly summarize the ideas I'm kind of going after. One, electric fields are caused by electric charges. Magnetic fields are caused by electric currents. Two, electric and magnetic fields created by these sources then interact with each other. Three, there is a perfect solution to these interactions, a very special field arrangement that has the very special property of reinforcing and creating itself. Four, these factory assembled fields, these cheat codes in the way fields interact, are called electromagnetic radiation or light, and they travel the universe in this beautiful, elegant, sinusoidal electromagnetic wave shape. Now, before we set things straight, let me just point out some immediate issues with these ideas that you might realize. Let's call these Sandy Checks. Even if these ideas aren't a correct reflection of our reality, are they at least internally consistent? First of all, if I look at one of these sinusoidal electromagnetic waves, what I see is an electric field and a magnetic field kind of moving in step with each other. But hold on, that's an issue. Because if one of these is causing the other, then we'd expect some sort of, I guess, time delay. We'd expect, say, the electric field to change first, and then that change to cause some change in the magnetic field. But that's not what we see. They're changing perfectly in step with each other. Which is definitely fishy if our misconception is right. So, suspicious note number one. If changing electric fields cause magnetic fields and vice versa, why are electric and magnetic fields in electromagnetic waves in perfect step with one another? Secondly, if I take two beams of light, uh, say from a laser or from a flashlight, and I do what the Ghostbusters tell you never to do and cross the streams, sure, at the point of crossing, I might see something crazy like an interference pattern or something like this, but after that, the beams continue totally unchanged, totally unaffected. The electromagnetic waves clearly aren't changed by crossing each other. This is why I can't build a lightsaber, no matter how much my 10-year-old's, or let's be honest, 30-year-old self wants one. If electromagnetic fields allegedly affect and cause one another, it seems awfully strange that two light beams can pass through one another without them having any effect on one another. So suspicious notion number two, if electric and magnetic fields interact, why don't electromagnetic waves interact? 
Thirdly, isn't it weird to say that currents create magnetic fields? I mean, electric charges are like fundamental things in our universe. You have electrons, you have protons, you have muons, and so on. But electric wires and electrical currents are just like a human technology. In fact, electric currents are really just a rebranding of electrical charges in a specific scenario. To see that this is the case, imagine two infinite lines of charge, one line of positive charge and one line of negative charge, sitting on top of each other. Now, if either of these charges were by themselves, they'd surround themselves with an electric field, because charges create electric fields. But because at every point along our line there are equal numbers of positive and negative charges, the net charge is zero, and therefore the electric field is zero. Of course, in this case, where both lines are stationary, there's no magnetic field either. This is basically the case of a neutral wire if there's no current. To make a current, all I need to do is then start moving one of these line charges at a constant speed. So really the idea of electrical currents is just sort of a, a cockamamie scheme to create a scenario where I have charges that are moving, but no actual net charges. So even though there are charges there, they're cancelled, so it's a purely magnetic situation because of that. This can be made pretty clear if I just show you the magnetic field around a single moving charge. So you see, a single charge moving with a constant speed sort of just dresses itself with a magnetic field as it moves. So suspicious notion number three, forget about currents. Uh, electric and magnetic fields don't really come from different places. In reality, any old charge which is moving has both an electric and magnetic field around it, just like an electromagnetic wave. So what's special about electromagnetic waves? So okay, then we've identified a fair amount of dubiousness around these ideas, but then how does it work? Well, let's say I have an electric charge just moving on some crazy trajectory through space. We don't care why it's moving that way or how it's moving that way. All we want to know is that at any given moment, what is the electric and magnetic field I will detect at some arbitrary point? Let's call that point A. If you can figure that out, you've essentially figured out all the physics of electromagnetism. That may seem like an exaggeration, but really, it's not. And that's because, as we'll see, electromagnetic fields don't interact at all, unlike our misconception. This means that the electromagnetic field, due to a large, complicated object made of billions of particles, is really just the sum of the individual fields of each particle. So if you know it for one particle, you know it for a billion particles. So with that in mind, all of electromagnetism can just be summed up like this. The electromagnetic field detected at a given point in space is just the time-delayed effect of the position, velocity, and acceleration of a charge at an earlier time. Now that's a bit wordy, but let me show you what I mean. One sort of way of thinking about this is that a charge is like a beacon, and at every moment it is broadcasting in all directions two pieces of information, its current velocity and how that current velocity is changing, in other words, its acceleration. And at every moment, moment to moment, that's all it does. However, these broadcasts it's sending out only travel at a set finite speed, the speed of light. To make this concrete, let's imagine taking a snapshot of our particle with its arbitrary trajectory at a specific moment in time. At this particular moment, it has a certain particular velocity, which is information not just about its speed, but also the direction of its motion, and it also has a particular acceleration. And these two things are basically the contents of the transmission it's going to broadcast at this moment. Now let's look at what happens to that broadcast after one second. After one second, this broadcast has traveled a distance of one light second. A light second is just a unit of distance of how far light travels in a second, so here is super useful. So this circle I've drawn here is showing a circle of one light second radius. Let's say after two and a half seconds, the message is now here, and it has just reached our point A. Now here are the two big points. One, when this happens, the electromagnetic field at A will be completely dictated by this charge velocity and acceleration information that it just received. And two, this isn't the charge's velocity and acceleration right now, it's its velocity and acceleration two and a half seconds ago. It's a time-delayed update. In fact, let's put this even more concretely. When a point A receives one of these messages from the charge, that message contains three pieces of information. The position of the charge when the message was sent, as well as its velocity and acceleration at that time. There is then a rule, which we'll call the leonard Wiechert rule, that takes as input these three quantities and spits out a corresponding value for the electric field. Actually, because Leonard Wiechert is hard to say, let's just call it the LW rule. 
In general, the way this rule works, if the velocity and acceleration aren't zero, the direction of the electric field will not point in the direction of the time delay position. It'll be pushed off in a slightly different direction. Whenever that happens, whenever the resulting electric field doesn't point in the direction of the time delay position, there will be a magnetic field. If I look at the direction of those two vectors when they don't point in the same direction, I can then draw a third vector, which is perpendicular to both of them, and that is going to be the direction of the magnetic field, and its strength is determined by how large the separation between those two vectors was. Now that may seem complicated, but the fact is that's actually the whole thing. So let's maybe summarize. If I have a charge, at any given moment a point A is receiving messages from the charge about its current position, velocity, and acceleration. However, because of the finite speed of light, when A receives those messages, they're out of date. So A doesn't respond to where the charge is now, but where it was. When it gets one of these time-delayed messages, it explicitly determines its electric field through this mysterious LW rule. If the electric field that it spits out doesn't point in the same direction as the time-delayed position, there will also be a magnetic field, and that points perpendicular to those two vectors. Done. That's the whole shebang. That's all of electromagnetism. Now that might not seem super satisfying, because it all seems to kind of rest on this mysterious LW rule, and I'll get to that, but already we can understand some of the issues with the ideas in the beginning of this video. All electromagnetic fields in the universe, be they electromagnetic radiation or not, are 100% just the result of receiving out-of-date status updates about the position, velocity, and acceleration of charges. So, very importantly, there is no causation, no interaction between electric and magnetic fields at all. In fact, there is a real, totally valid way of thinking about the physics of electromagnetism where electromagnetic fields themselves are basically just red herrings. They're misdirects. At the end of the day, the only real detectable effect of electromagnetism is that charges can exert forces on other charges. The only complexity is the form of those forces and the fact that their effect is time delayed. Electric and magnetic fields are just glorified mathematical bookkeeping devices invented to keep track of this time delayed force of charges on charges. You may go to a science lab and find a device that is called an electric or magnetic field detector, but these devices don't really detect electric or magnetic fields. Instead, they are devices that have charges inside them, and what they really measure is how the charges inside the device are affected by the charge you're measuring. So in a sense, the device is false advertising. It's impossible to directly measure an electromagnetic field. Fields are created by charges and their motion, and their effects are only observable when they produce forces on other charges at some later time. Okay, so let's get back to this LW equation. When I first talked about it, I kind of just said it was like a magic box. It takes in a time-delayed charge position, velocity, and acceleration, and it spits out an electric field vector. The reason I was so vague is because the equation itself is kind of complicated. Let me just throw it up. Now don't worry if you have equation phobia, I'm not expecting anyone to get anything out of this, I just wanted to show that it's a big honking complicated equation. But looking through the complexity, it roughly just has two terms, or two separate parts. Part number one depends on the time delayed distance and velocity of the charge in the past, we'll call this the position velocity field. Part number two depends on the same things but also the acceleration, we'll call this the acceleration field. Though it's actually more common to call the second part the radiation field. To see why, let's go back to our little particle broadcasting its little message. And imagine I took one of these concentric circles and walked around it, tallying up the strength of the electric field at each point. Actually, more correctly, we should actually tally up the energy in the electric fields. When I do this, I'm basically determining the total energy of the field at a certain distance from a source of the field. Then imagine I went to another one of these circles, one that is farther out, and I do it again. And again, I get a final total energy tally. If I compare these two tallies, one from a point closer to the charge and one from a point farther from the charge, there are really only three ways that they can compare. If the field is greater the farther out I go, well, then I've broken physics. That means that the field is actually conjuring energy from some eldritch void, gaining energy as it goes farther and farther out. It also means that if we add up the entire energy of the field, it'll be infinite. So, you know, step one, create an infinite energy field. Step two, extract infinite energy. Step three, profits. This is what we call in the biz an unphysical possibility. Another option is that the tally gets less and less as they go farther out. 
This means that the energy in the field is tapering off to nothing at greater and greater distances. What this means is that the field carries energy, but that energy isn't going anywhere. It's kind of just hanging around the vicinity of the charge like a wet towel. An analogy I've always liked is a field like this is like flies swarming around a garbage truck. The garbage truck is the charge, and the energy of the field like this is bound to stick close to it. We'll call this a dressing field, because it kind of just augments or dresses the area around the charge. The final option is that the tally doesn't change at all. It's the same total, no matter how far away you do your tally. For a field like this, even if you're infinitely far away, the total energy of the field is the same. In a very real sense, such a field is carrying energy away from a charge to infinity. We call this a radiating field. So bringing things back to our LW rule, when a charge receives one of these status updates, it does different things with the position velocity information than it does with the acceleration information. One forms the position velocity field, which is non-radiating, and one forms the acceleration field, which is radiating. In fancy language, we say that the energy of the position velocity field falls off like an inverse fourth power law, where the energy of the acceleration field falls off like an inverse second power or inverse square law. And so the energy in the field at any distance is a constant, even at infinite distances. Now if that's a bit confusing, they say that a picture is worth a thousand words, so a gift's got to be worth, like, a million? Let me place down an electric charge and look at the strength of its electric and magnetic field. Now its magnetic field is zero, because it's not moving, and its electric field falls off at distance like this. This is a case where there's only the position velocity field. Now let me give it a quick acceleration, a quick jostle. You see that? That was the radiating field. That right there, the blob, that was light. Compare this to our alleged sinusoidal snowflake. It doesn't look sinusoidal at all. In fact, let me accelerate the charge again, but just a little differently, you know, a different flick of the wrist. You see, the shape changed. The shape of electromagnetic radiation is just totally arbitrary. It just depends on the specific way a specific charge happened to accelerate that one time. This isn't light in the wild. This is, and it's just a time-delayed status update of an acceleration. So let's just recap our misconceptions. 1. Electric fields are caused by electric charges, magnetic fields are caused by electric currents. No, the electromagnetic field I detect at a point is just an out-of-date status update of the past position and velocity and acceleration of a charge. 2. Electric and magnetic fields created by these sources then interact with each other. They don't interact with each other. Their form was set the second that particle did a thing in the past. 3. There is a perfect solution to these interactions, a very special field arrangement that has the very special property of reinforcing and creating itself. Yeah, again, they don't interact. And 4. These factory assembled field, these cheat codes and the way fields interact, are called electromagnetic radiation or light, and they travel the universe in this beautiful, elegant, sinusoidal, electromagnetic wave shape. Yeah, no, they, they kind of just look like bleh. It depends what the acceleration was. So hopefully that makes things about electromagnetism a little clearer. Have a good one. This video, and all Atoms and Sparks videos, are sort of a condensed discussion on a set of blog posts from the Atoms and Sparks blog. If you want to find out more detail about the stuff that was discussed here, the corresponding blog post is linked below. Also, check the blog to vote on new episode topics and see some discussion on other topics.